Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Patrick. Thank you for joining me on the Well Standard Podcast. We have a couple of episodes left, and then we're done with this uh, this season on entrepreneurship. Before I get into my guest and his bio and just a fascinating uh, story as well as cause, I just wanted to remind you guys about the Unleash the Power Within event, the Tony Robbins event that I would love for you to join me on. I secured tickets, uh, you know, at well below what they're selling for. I think like the top ticket, the best seats, like a thousand, more than a thousand dollars off of that. Uh, listen, I would love to have you join me. It's in, it's in March, San Jose. Uh, there's some people coming from our, 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 uh, my office and uh, it's going to be an awesome event. So hopefully you guys can join us. If you guys go to the show notes, I'll have all the contact information for uh, Jeff, who's the, the contact I have over at TonyRobbins.com and he can, he can hook you guys up. Uh, so again, love for you guys to join me. It'd be an incredible experience for you and help you to I would understand your, help you understand yourself at a higher level and perhaps uh, give you that motivation that you need to implement some of the things we've been talking about on, the, on this season uh, of the podcast. All right, now to my guest. So I've, I've hinted at the, uh, you know, the, the social ideas, the environmental ideas uh, that people have when it comes to the challenges that exist. You know, and and I, would, I would say that you know, the past has really put the onus of solving some of these environmental challenges, social challenges on the shoulders of government, uh, pub, you know, public servants. And, you know, the, the guest I had a couple of years ago, uh, Josh Land and Lisa Land, I actually had them on a couple of times, I wrote a book called The Social Capitalist. Uh, you know, there's other books that have come out about social consciousness, uh, uh, you know, conscious capitalism. There's this, this, uh, focus on doing things that are good for everyone. Uh, there's like socially conscious, you know, uh, investment funds. Now there's tax credits for doing environmentally conscious things. So this is, this is a topic that I would say is getting, is gaining in popularity. And my guest is touching on something that I was really surprised by, which is a, uh, something that we all need to survive, which is water. But the uh, overwhelming amount and and scope of challenge that exists with just water, uh, and it, it, even in the United States. And we mentioned, you know, on the on the episode about you know the, the Netflix docu series uh, of Bill Gates and the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the uh, what they've done in in uh, emerging markets, third world uh, countries, in regards to the cleanliness of water and sanit, you know the the sanitary benefits from having you know good plumbing, good infrastructure. Uh, but this this is at a new level, and it's really interesting. I want you guys to pay attention to it, and uh, because it's a challenge, and the responsibilities as far as uh, water is concerned, the cleanliness of water is right now on you know, public utility companies, or, or it's, it's on, you know, those that don't necessarily get funding to improve and, and adapt to, you know, changes in, you know, whether it's uh, cities growing uh, and so forth. And then, you know, we, we talk about the EPA as, as well in, uh, in this episode and some of the challenges that exist there. But Seth is on top of it. He's a successful attorney, entrepreneur, business owner, and he's taking the skills that he has uh, you know, uh, acquired, I sound like Liam Neeson, acquired over the course of my career. Uh, anyway, he's taken those skills and brought that to the marketplace in uh, leading, uh, essentially writing books and increasing awareness of the challenges that exist with just the simple uh, drinking water uh, and, and why that's the result of you know, changes in human behavior. So it's fascinating. Uh, so I hope you guys pay attention. I mean, that seemed the mo like the most sexy thing in the world, but uh, you know, Seth is essentially writing books. He's got a, it's a New York Times bestseller on on water, uh, but that's how significant uh, of an issue he believes it is, and he's dedicated the rest of his life uh, to to bringing awareness so that something can be done because it is a it's a it, it's a universal problem, uh, and uh, and I would say there are solutions. He has solutions. He's met with scientists. There's inventions. There's huge opportunities there. It's just the shift from the structure that exists right now into a new structure. Uh, and a lot of that's just going to come by more social awareness uh, and, and, and sharing it and speaking to it. So hope you guys pay attention. Hope you enjoyed the episode, but let me give you a, a, his bio quick before I bring him on. Uh, so Seth Siegel, is a, he's a serial entrepreneur, a water activist, and a New York Times bestselling author. He, uh, 
his critically acclaimed award-winning book, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World. Uh, it's been published in 17 different languages, and it's on sale in 50 different countries. Uh, and then he has his new book, uh, which is called Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink? And it sets forth you know, an ambitious agenda for a fundamental rethinking of America's drinking water system. Uh, and Seth has been recognized for his thought leadership and advocacy on water scarcity and quality. And he's a, a senior fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Water Policy. And he's, uh, his commentary has been in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. And, and one more thing I'll say before I bring him on. You guys remember a couple of episodes uh, when I had uh, Mike Moyer on. And we talked about this bottle. If you guys are watching on video, if you're not, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. But this, uh, this is a Kissingen water by the Hanbury Smith Company out of New York. And what's really cool, and I share this with, uh, share this with Seth, uh, you know, one of my ancestors uh, in the 1800 brought one of the first like mineral water, bottled water companies uh, to bring clean water, drinking water uh, to the limelight uh, in New York City. And it, uh, it was a fascinating story. I'm, I'm still in the process of you know, writing that out. I know I said I would share that with listeners, but uh, it's just an interesting coincidence that Seth is coming on and we had a, a conversation about it. He's in New York City. Uh, so what's cool is, is, you know, the, the issue of clean water isn't a new thing. Uh, and and I, I would assume most of us believe that that's fixed, that we, you know, drink a water, you know, bottled water or, uh, you know, filtered water. That's not the case. So you guys are going to want to pay attention and uh, definitely follow, uh, follow Seth. He's on social media. His Twitter handles is something that we'll uh, post. Uh, so go to the show notes to get all of the, uh, the notes for this episode, as well as the links to his website and some of the initiatives he has going, as well as links to buy the book. Okay, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, my guest, Seth Siegel. Hey, Seth, it's, it's such an honor to have you on, and thank you for, for taking the time. This is going to be a fascinating topic. I'm really, really excited to interview you. So welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here, too. I've uh, following you a little bit, and I've been enjoying uh, learning more about you. Listen, Seth, you know, I... I became kind of I became fascinated with how, you know, I think Bill Gates is you know recently with his documentary on on Netflix or documentary series right of of taking business knowledge and business wisdom and bringing that to some of the social and environmental challenges that are you know, the world society has uh, and you know uh, Peter Diamandis and his X Prize where they're you know raising money to reward entrepreneurs. Uh, well, challenging them and then rewarding them to solve problems. Right? I think it's a fascinating approach to, to, to some of the challenges that we, we have and will have in the future. And so that's why I'm excited to talk to you because you've, you, know, you have two books, uh, one, a New York Times best, bestseller, uh, and, and, a, and a, a new one as well, Troubled Water. It's dedicated to bringing awareness to, to a problem that most people may not uh, recognize as a, as a problem or as a challenge. So would you, would you speak to what you have been uh, trying to, to uh, help improve the awareness of uh, when it comes to uh, uh, just something, a, a simple, abundant, what we assume abundant commodity of water? Yes. So uh, that's precisely what my life's work is and has been for about 10 years now. Uh, I had a wonderfully uh, enjoyable, successful business career. I believe in the power of business uh, and the markets to transform the world. Um, I, I believe also in a non-finger-pointing, non-villain-seeking uh, way of problem-solving. And so I've written both of these books. Uh, the first one, Let There Be Water, which is about water scarcity, and the new one, Troubled Water, What's Wrong With What We Drink, about water quality. And, but both of them have a similarity, which is I'm trying to expand awareness of people of what is this great, vast commodity, water, but what it is not, it is not inexhaustible like sunshine or air. And so what we need to do is to get higher quality, more certainty of supply. We need to raise awareness. So when people think about um, uh, water, at least as much they think about energy supply, we'll be in a much better place. Except this is more personal. Because the fact that drinking water so completely affects our, our health and the health of our children, the health of our communities, I've taken it upon myself to campaign for a more rigorous health standard around drinking water and to raise awareness of the significant number of gaps. Uh, like most people, I, I believe when I started this book, uh, the research of this book, that everything was fine. The EPA was looking out for me. The municipalities were looking out for me. And what I learned is, unfortunately, that 
the standards that are set uh, are, are significantly below the health standard that we need. That the last time the EPA has regulated any contaminant for drinking water, and there are over 100,000 candidates, uh, and there are only 70 chemicals that are regulated by the EPA, but less than they've regulated any contaminant is 23 years ago. And this led me to understand that we have a very serious problem and a gap, and this is gonna lead to something of a citizen's uprising at some point, and I wanted to head that off. I wanted to be a little bit of a Paul Revere calling out a problem, and very much of a Johnny Appleseed calling out a solution. And that's the tack that I took in Let There Be Water, about water scarcity, and that's very much the tack I'm taking here. But the difference uh, from, from just last time to this time is that with Troubled Water, I'm not just writing a book. I'm writing a book as a jumping off point for what I hope will be a social movement that will demand greater involvement, more research, more technology, smarter pricing, and consolidation of utilities to assure a better health outcome for all of us. I'd just like to share one last thought and um, because some listeners may be, um, or viewers may be asking themselves, why am I doing this? Or sure, it's easy to talk about, or I'm hyping the issue so I can make more sales. And that is that uh, my wife and I made a decision early on in the process of the first book, that if I'm gonna talk about a society, uh, society altering problem, and I want people to take me seriously, I will need to make sure that everyone knows what my motivations are. So as was the case with Let There Be Water, I have donated 100% of all royalties, not the net, but the gross, uh, to uh, water-themed charities. So I am completely in this as a volunteer to help make society better. And I have no, uh, well, I hope every one of your listeners buys 500 copies and gives it to 499 of their best friends. The truth of the matter is that whether they do or don't, there's absolutely no uh, material impact on my life. What's the, and that, that's, that's really, it's really helpful. And I, you know, and we, for better, or for worse, we live in a society that, you know, goes to motive as to what we talk about, what we claim, especially when it comes to so, social issues, but we won't necessarily go there. What, maybe as a couple of just final questions, what is, what is the outcome you're hoping for? Somebody reads the book and what do you want them to understand from reading that book? And more importantly, what would you want them to share or talk to others about? What I want everyone to understand is that our water supply, our drinking water supply, is not as healthy or as safe as we have been led to believe that it is. And I'm, you know, sort of a center of the road, business guy, family act, a family-centered guy, community activist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist on any topic at all. The science here is completely unmistakable, and that is that there are many, many, many contaminants, thousands of contaminants that are found throughout the American drinking water system. We don't know what the health effect of these are. There is no entity that is out there protecting us by either filtering them out or by doing advanced research on them to make sure that if they are harmless, that we know that they are harmless. And so my goal is to raise awareness first and foremost, and hopefully to galvanize uh, some activism where people will say, now that I know more, I wanna do more. And, the, and what I wanna do more is I'd like, to, I'd like to, as I say, create a social movement akin to the rise of environmentalism I, the, the difference here is that drinking water um, should, should be thought of as a public health issue and not as, as an environmental issue. And what I want other people to tell their people, I want other people, I want people to tell their friends a, a, about this is to say that, that we have a problem here that we have not been led to believe is a problem, but that everyone or large numbers of people I suspect already know is a problem. And how do I know that? Because last year in the United States, 70 billion containers of bottled water were sold in the United States. And what has happened is while the EPA has been uh, in, inactive or not adequately active, what has happened is that America has adopted a parallel drinking water system by default. We've created a solid waste problem of 70 billion containers that need to be disposed of, although the vast majority of them are never recycled. And, um, and, but much, much worse than that is that, that, that we have an opportunity with current technology at very affordable prices to make the water as clean and as safe as, as, um, as, as science could allow. So Seth, maybe one of the final questions I had, because again, this is a better or for worse. It's, you know, our society doesn't pay attention to something unless, you know, it, it seems that the, there are, ex, there are extremes, right? And unfortunately that's how the, you know, the news seems to be running social media is whenever there's this kind of extreme on the, on the tail of the bell curve, as far as, you know, the urgency associated with it. 
uh, that something has to be done is, is when people pay attention. So what are maybe some of the extremes that you have discovered uh, that most people uh, would be surprised by? Well, uh, I'll tell you a couple of, uh, if you want just data, I'll give you some data points that, uh, that God, but I'll just share with you that your, your mindset that you're absolutely right. It's been the cable newsification of American society, whereby if it's not in the hot news, it's, it's not relevant. I, I, because of my charitable work, I've gotten to know uh, on a very close and warm basis, a number of senators and congressmen from both parties. And I was in conversation recently with a senator, a well-known person, not a presidential candidate, one of the few who's not been a presidential candidate. And, uh, and uh, he, he, he said to me that, that, that uh, we public officials, we senators, he said, we'd rather spend six or seven or 10 times the money when it becomes a crisis than to head it off because we can't get public support for doing things. So what I'm trying to do is to give the tools to those elected officials by having ordinary citizens, by having suburban moms, knowing about the fact that there are all kinds of what are called endocrine disrupting compounds, these things that monkey with the hormones in the body system that, um, that are affecting their children, that are affecting their parents, that are affecting them in all kinds of different ways, and that we need to figure out a way uh, using existing science to transform our system. So if you, if you want me to give you a couple of for instances, the number one, for instance, is the fact that every day, every day, 70% of Americans 12 and over take at least one prescription medication, and 20% and, uh, of Americans 12 and over take at least five prescription medicines. And what people don't think about is what happens to that. What happens is we excrete it. It either goes down our toilets or our washing machines or our showers, gets pooled together. The wastewater treatment that we use is about a 100-year-old system. Society has radically changed in those in the last 75 years, that's 50 years for sure. We are much more industrial. We have many more chemicals. There are now 50,000 50, FDA approved pharmaceutical products and another 5,000 over the counter ones. And these are getting into our drinking water and coming back at us because it's not being treated out of our water, it's coming back at us. And if you think about these medications, each of them has a purpose. The FDA approves a medication for the proper person and the proper dosage, for the proper duration, to solve the proper problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what happens when we are all ingesting a cocktail of these pharmaceutical products at different doses for all kinds of different people, for all kinds of different longevities, and with what effect? And we're not really sure. But what we do know is there's been an explosion in the United States over the past handful of years of a whole host of health conditions. Uh, ADHD is one of the most prominent of them, but, but others as well, or, uh, obesity is another. And all of these are functions of the endocrine system or the hormonal system being interrupted. This affects fertility. This affects uh, sexual desire. This has all kinds of effects. And I, I am of the belief, and this is not me because I'm not a scientist. I am quoting scientists, esteemed scientists who I interviewed and who led me to this conclusion. Uh, we understand that there is a really very serious concern that we don't know what the effect is on our bodies, but we see what's happening in society with a sense that that very possibly this environmental attack is coming at us from our drinking water. Um, if I could, just one other element I'd like to say, which yeah, is absolutely. that the other thing that people have no, you said, like, sort of what will surprise us? So I'll tell you another thing that will surprise us. What will surprise you is the fact that, is the fact that there are so many drinking water utilities in the United States. A rational number, I believe, would be about 250 to 400 utilities around the U.S. There are 50 states. Not every state needs to have their own utility, but I could see why everyone would want to have at least one. And big states like Texas or California could see having six or eight or 10. And that would make sense. I mean, it'd be a proper number. You could get the right amount of science and technology and finance and all that you would need. <clears throat> but the actual number, and I, if I was playing a game with you, I'd ask you to guess. I know what I started with audiences. Um, the actual number is 51,535. What? Exactly. And there are so many utilities, 46,000 of them are very, very tiny populations, but they add up to millions and millions of people. And so what happens is, is that they are so small and so underfunded that they don't have the capacity to attract the most recent graduates of the best uh, engineering programs. <clears throat> they don't have the ability to buy or even to know about which are the best technologies they should be installing. 
innovation and stifling. And, well, the innovation that is stifling innovation. And finally, you probably heard that there, we have a very old national water infrastructure system. Yeah. Which in, in next, starting immediately, we need replacement, but certainly over the next 20 years, we'll need replacement. But these utilities, which amass large parts of the country, don't have the funding or the know-how to replace the, the 1.1 million miles of water mains that need to be replaced. There were 240,000 water mains last year that broke in the United States because they're too old and they're, and they're defective now. And lest you think that this is just sort of like, uh, you know, there's so many utilities because they're in the northern reaches of North Dakota or, of, you know, rural Arkansas or something like that. I want you to understand and your, and your viewers and listeners to understand that actually in Los Angeles County alone, there are more than 200 water utilities. And so how this all came to be, I talk about at length in my book, um, why and how we're gonna fix this and change this, I talk about in my book. But the fact remains is that we have a system right now that is forcing us to not have the most pro-health orientation possible. Well, one thing I was gonna, this keeps going through my mind is what I mentioned at the beginning, which I'll, which I'll repeat, is as far as like these types of, whether it's utilities or it's infrastructure, there's always been a dependence on it coming from uh, uh, government, right? Com whether it's local or state or, or, or federal. And, and, and you're hitting the nail on the head because of, you know, I would say, lack of innovation. You're, you're, there's gaps and those gaps compound. And now you're starting to see the results of that. And like I said, I, I think there are, there's this misconception that bottled water or certain filtration systems uh, do the trick so you, so you don't drink your tap water but you're you're base you're arguing that that is not the case and that there is a, a much bigger problem at hand yes and, exactly and that and that so that some i think i heard this statistic that some 60 percent of americans have bought or currently use some type of filtering system in their homes which sounds high to me but it's certainly not impossible um and and, 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 but the problem is, is that there are very few systems, except for the very, very expensive ones, that bring the water to the quality that you would think that it would. So that if you buy a, a countertop pitcher system, unless you're very lucky that your community only has one single contaminant and you match it with that contaminant, or with the filter, that you're going to be fine. Uh, and, and, and so here, here's, the, here's the phrase that I'd like you and all of your uh, listeners and followers to, to know, and that is that legal does not necessarily equal safe. And what I mean by that is that the EPA creates these standards. They say there are 91 contaminants, 70 chemicals of that 91. And these are the regulated contaminants. And then a utility is told, as long as you keep those contaminants below a certain, what they call health level, you can transport the water all you want. Now, we're not exactly sure that all those quote unquote health levels are actually healthy. It's possible that they're higher than they should be. But let's assume that the EPA is right. But what then doesn't happen is that anything else that's in the water, any other contaminant that's in the water, does not, there's no legal obligation whatsoever by any utility to filter or treat out that, those other contaminants. And so the water may be legal. The mayor may say, we have not had a violation of the EPA in five years or 10 years or ever. But it doesn't mean that the people in the community are getting safe water. The other thing that should be kept in mind is that last year there were 80,000 violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, the official listed number is about 12,700 of them are health violations, meaning the water is actually on un unhealthy levels of contaminants. But experts who've studied this believe that because it's an honor system, a self-reporting system, they believe that the number of actual health violations could be, might be as much as 40 or 50,000 violations in a given year. And this is a pretty standard uh, fixed number year to year. And, and so our testing system is wrong. Our reporting system is wrong. Our accountability by the state and by the EPA is all, is all I think, upside down and backwards. We are too focused on making sure that the utility ha has the tools that they need and that they're not unduly burdened when our entire perspective should be on, on public health. Uh, of course, obviously at an affordable price, but that is, we know with current technology is completely doable. Okay, so Seth, th this is where maybe a, fi a final point, so we don't just make our our audience make the audience stir crazy and, and, and anxious. What what are what are a few of the solutions that you t you talk about? Maybe with the top two. Okay, so if I can, if you allow me to have three. 
Okay. okay. So, 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 so the first and I think most important and the reason I wrote the book and the reason I'm <clears throat> traveling from community to community and I've spoken, I don't mean the financial community, I've spoken before a number of very well-known banks. And if any of your listeners are the financial community, I would, I know you're going to give everybody contact information. I would really love for you to contact me and let's find a way for me to speak either by Skype or live before your audiences to talk about this. But the first thing is really to create a citizens movement akin to the environmental movement of the 70s and 80s, whereby citizens understand that this is a remediable, solvable problem at an affordable price, which will have an almost immediately positive effect on society's health and well-being. And most people think, when they think about this thing about lead pipes in Flint, Michigan, there are 10 and a half million lead pipes in America. You know, a survey taken by New York State says that 82% of New York State schools have lead pipes in them. So we are, we are really poisoning our children. Poisoning all, ourselves. All over the place. So, so that's number one. So the first thing is I want to create citizen awareness. And by citizen awareness, people will start grousing and will start demanding more. And the solution then comes from the fact that we'll have a systemic change. The second solution I would like us to have is we can't do it nationally. I'd like to have us do it community by community. I profile in the book Orange County, California. And I do that deliberately because I want everyone to understand that here is a community that made a choice to ignore the EPA guidelines and to choose something that brings the water to basically no contaminants whatsoever. They made a choice to purify their water at a much higher level. And they do this, they do this at a cost of about 60 cents a week per person. And they have as part of that cost, they also have a whole problem about ocean infiltration. So the rest of America wouldn't have that. But even if we did, it's $30 a year per person. And that is not a very large amount of money, particularly when you ask the $20 billion a year we're spending in America for bottled water, to say nothing of the waste problem that that creates. And the third solution I offer people is if you can't do it nationally, you can't do it in your community, is that I offer at the end of my book solutions for you, what you can do in your own home and how you can make and, and do your best to try to protect yourself, your families, because it's possible that, that you and I will not be affected by this. We're healthy, you know, in the prime of our lives type of people. Although even that's not clear, by the way. But what is almost a certainty is that pregnant women, fetuses, newborns up to the age of, and children up to the age of five, people who are immunosuppressed because you've had a bad cold or you've had a disease, and certainly anybody on chemotherapy are all at risk and so, uh, from these contaminants. And so therefore, uh, for our own sakes, we need to protect ourselves, whether it's nationally, whether it's communally, or whether it's individually protecting ourselves and our families in our own homes. Um, so, so those are choices. I, I want to say one last word, which is there's a, a, a faulty thinking that bottled water is universally healthier than, than uh, tap water. As I wrote in my book, 70%, 70% of the bottled water sold in the United States is subject to no federal regulation whatsoever. Nothing, zero. Not FDA, not EPA, zero. And there's a quirk in the law, which I think is crazy, which exempts uh, all these water companies from any type of uh, federal regulation. They're subject to state regulation for those few states that actually regulate drinking water. And, um, and so for the a vast amount, we don't know the amount because no one's regulating it, but a vast amount of the bottled water sold in the United States is literally tap water put into a bottle that is then sealed. Now, that's not true of some of the bigger brands, uh, some of the more prominent brands, but on a volume basis, it's totally true of most of the water that's sold in the United States. Is there some sort of index or something that's done privately that, that, that rates the types of bottled water that's out there? Well, I'll tell you this. The last, time, the last time anyone did a study, and it was done by the Natural Resources Defense Council about 20 years ago, they surveyed several hundreds of bottled water brands. They took three examples of each of them. And they found something quite remarkable, that, that the, a very large percentage of them had contaminants or E. coli in them. Uh, really hard to believe, right? But, but nonetheless, it was there. And um, number one. Number two is they found that even when you had three bottles from the same producer and you tested them side by side by side, some of them were contaminated and some of them weren't contaminated. So it doesn't necessarily mean that everything from brand X is bad and that everything from brand Y is good. So you, you're confused. And the, and, the, and, and the other problem is about plastic uh, drinking water bottles is that we now know 
that the plastic leaches uh, um, hydrochemicals, hydrocarbon chemicals, into the water if it's in a if it's kept in a warm environment. And since we don't know how the bottled water was kept, you know, in the summertime or if it's in a warm warehouse, therefore we have good reason to fear, I think, that the water may um, may not be as pure as we are led to believe it might be. Even that's I'm talking about even for the very good bottled waters. So that's, so that's the concern that I think people should have about bottled water. And therefore, defaulting to bottled water as a solution is probably what used to be called the fool's paradise. Well, Seth, this has been a, a, a fascinating discussion. We could probably keep going. Uh, but I know that a lot of what you're talking about is in your book. So we'll make sure we get the word out because this is, it was surprising to me. Doing some research for the interview, um, I... It intrigued me, right? At the same time, it made me it made me really concerned because uh, I I love I love water. I drink water more than anything else, which I, I assume is healthy. Uh, but in the end, you know, I, I looked into some of the stuff that you've been talking about, and I can't wait to read more in your in your book. And we'll make sure we post it on our social media channels so we can get the word out. You know, and if, if people don't have the patience to read a whole book, <laughs> I, I also I, I'm on Twitter. Uh, virtually every day talking about water issues. So I'm also at Seth M. Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L. But, but obviously the book is the more comprehensive approach. And, and I would suggest also to people, if you have a friend or a, a government official or a journalist that you know, um, and I'm so delighted to be on your podcast as a result of this, uh, that please spread the word. We will not have the changes we need until it becomes conventional wisdom that we have a, a, a fractured drinking water system that could be so much better. Well, Seth, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your mission with us. And, uh, and we'll, let, we'll, we'll stay in touch because I have some contacts I'd love to get you in front of. Great. Okay. I'd love to. Bye-bye.